as Bridget said, I'm Guy Canavan, uh, I'm a naval architect. Mike uh, approached me sometime last year to come and do a talk. At the time, I was uh, quite busy. We were trying to get the boat out of the shed. Uh, so I declined the offer then. And then earlier this year, he came to see us again. And uh, I thought the project would have been finished by now and I'd have had weeks to prepare this presentation. At the moment, the boat's sitting, well, probably just off the Isle of Wight doing sea trials, probably the busiest part of the project. So I have done a presentation. It's possibly not quite as polished as I'd have liked to have done. Uh, so if there's an issue, I do apologize. Right, uh, just a back, bit of background about myself. I came late into the world of naval architecture uh, I, as a mature student. Most, uh, most kids take a sort of a year out of school or a year off after they leave school before going to university. I took a decade. Uh, during, that, during that time, I did, I did a number of jobs, including boat building. I worked for the uh, Windermere Steamboat uh, Museum up in, up in Windermere, uh, restoring their collection of steam yachts. And then at the ripe old age of, I don't know, 27, something like that, I thought to myself, well, it's OK as a job. It funds my Friday and Saturday nights out, uh, but I needed a, a career. So always interested in boats. So I ended up uh, going to Southampton Solent, or the Institute as it was in those days, uh, and doing a degree in yacht and powercraft design. Following that, as Bridget said, I went and joined BMT Defence Services uh, after having decided that drawing America's Cup yachts was, wasn't for... I wasn't able to get into that area of, uh, of naval architecture. I managed to get chartered in 2004, uh, and then after, shortly after that, I moved to BAE Systems down in Portsmouth Naval Base, uh, where I was head of the design office down there with about 70 sort of naval architects, engineers across various disciplines. And then in 2000, 2008 was when I first got involved in the project. Uh, the owner at the time, or the, the, the prospective owner at the time, was wanting to, to buy this yacht uh, and was potentially going to use the infrastructure within the naval base to, to do the work. Uh, I found myself driving up to Lowestoft with a couple of others to have a look at this, this old yacht. And uh, she, she looked OK with a, with a brief visual inspection. Uh, unfortunately, the dockyard wasn't able to pull its finger out in time to, uh, to get the work in. Uh, so it went elsewhere. It turned out I knew the owner's uh, sort of the, the owner's rep, uh, and I used to contact him every now and again, just to ask how things were going. That bore fruit in, in I suppose, early 2011, uh, when I got a phone call to go for dinner with them, and uh, they said, "Well, guy, we had someone like you to run the design team. We could do it in house, and we wouldn't have the inefficiencies of of a uh, using an external contractor." So. I thought about it for a very short length of time, because uh, at the time I was having quite, I'd had quite a good opportunity within the naval base. But the next morning I realised there was no way that I was going to be able to let that opportunity slide. Uh, so I rang him up and said, uh, if the terms and conditions are right, I'm, I'm your man. The problem was, coming from a, a large corporate background, going off on my own as a one band man, I had no idea what the right terms and conditions were. So. I find myself here today, sort of three years after, after I joined the project, uh, giving this presentation. Now, it's going to be split into three parts, time allowing. Uh, first, there's going to be a presentation on the boat. In, to provide some continuity with the last speaker, this is one of those elderly ships where we worked on the margins. Uh, after that's, that's just accompanied by lots of pictures. Uh, and then I'm going to do a short piece on, on basically designing a 65 meter yacht without the infrastructure required to design a 65 metre yacht and, and some of the issues and some of the background issues that we overcame whilst doing it. And then finally, uh, there'll be sort of a Q&A session if possible uh, and depending on time, there'll either be a video with that or we'll do it just before. Right. Now this is, this is Shimara. Uh, she's 65 metres long, but this is the original launch in uh, Wollstone from the uh, Thornycroft yard. Uh, this was in April, this was in April 1938 and she had a keel laid down in, in 1937. She was built for uh, Sir Bernard Docker, who was the chairman of BSA, Birmingham Small Arms. Uh, he was 
quite a sort of a social animal. Uh, used to enjoy the party scene, and I think he'd had this boat built uh, as, his, as his party boat. Now, this, this picture is actually, is actually post-war, uh, but just to point out some of the, some of the key features of it, uh, she's basically got two main internal decks. You've got a lower deck down here where the deck's below the waterline. Uh, this deck above the waterline, you've got the main saloon back in this area of the boat. Uh, this is how she was, and actually how, how, basically how she is now. Uh, You'll see some of the pictures in a minute. You'll be able to see these double sort of port lights together uh, to, to orientate yourself. And then the superstructure tiers were split into, into two. You had this lower area, and at the front with these, with these square windows with the round tops to them, that's the owner's area. And on top of that, you've got the bridge, and then there was a small uh, observation deck on top of that. But we'll, we'll come back to that picture shortly. Right, this was taken from the original, original uh, I think it was a Yachting World uh, brochure in 1938 that, uh, that showed the inside of Shamara. Uh, this is the owner's lounge uh, that was in the forward end of the first superstructure tier. Uh, quite, I, I, I'm a naval architect, so I've got no styling, I've not got a styling bone in my body. Uh, but I suppose, is that Art Deco? I don't, I don't know. So that was, the, that was the owner's lounge. And then this is the, this is the saloon. You'll see those two, uh, those, those double port lights here. And then if you keep an eye on, on some of this, this furniture, you might see some of it later on as well. But this was, the, this was the main lounge at the back of the boat. Right, obviously she was launched in April 38. Uh, within 18 months, Britain was at war. Now, Shamara was taken up from, from trade, I suppose, uh, and was, was turned into a submarine or an anti-submarine warfare training ship based on the Clyde. Uh, even though she was a training ship, she was, she was equipped with uh, various bits of weaponry. This is, on, this is on the aft deck. I think it's a Vickers, like a double Vickers machine gun uh, for potentially anti-aircraft use. On the foredeck, uh, they actually built a platform and put this larger gun on it, uh, surrounded by the smiling crew in this photo. And then uh, later on in the war, she had these hedgehogs fitted. These were sort of forward-facing or forward-firing uh, anti-submarine mortars, I suppose. Now, the only... I mean, Apart from the actual weapon itself, it's interesting. This they've got this anti-blast protection on the on the bridge. Now, had I seen this photo when I first started the project, I may have suggested a similar thing with our insulation, because fitting it on the inside of the boat was actually quite a challenge. Uh, thanks to the MCA's rules on how much protection you need nowadays. Right. This this looks more like a train. I think this is probably a training exercise rather than an actual. Uh, real life real life incident because it's the ship's lifeboats and they're climbing back up now this for me this slide's quite interesting because there's two there's two areas on it firstly is the height of these port lights above the waterline we've we've had a they traditionally had quite low port lights because the the, the lower deck was quite low uh, but there's a rule that they have to be at least 500 meters or or sort of 18 inches, 20 inches in, in Christian units above the, uh, above the waterline. Uh, and there she's really pushing the boundaries. She's probably 100, 150 tons heavier than she's now in a, in a fully displaced mode. The other area that's, that's relevant to the current time is, is their life raft embarkation ladder. We have exactly the same type of ladder. Hopefully it's not exactly the same one. But here we have the crew vaulting over the rail. Now, for health and safety reasons, that's no longer allowed. Uh, so we're actually just retrofitting a gate into the, uh, into the rail to allow them to, to climb on board with some comfort. And actually, it's also for use by the, uh, by the pilot. Right, this is, a, this is a wartime painting of the boat. Uh, 
Now I suspect this is probably early war. Uh, you'll see why in a minute, partly because of the, the large gun on the foredeck. And then this is a later photo. The gun has disappeared uh, to be replaced by this hedgehog. And also the aft mast has also disappeared. Uh, whether by, whether by accident or by design, I'm not sure, but the aftermath has, has disappeared in that photo. Now, she was demobbed in, in, in 1946 uh, and then went back to uh, Sir Bernard Docker, probably after a, a significant refit at the taxpayer's expense. Now, interesting things on this, interesting things on this photo are the radar. Now, it was only whilst looking at this photo as part of this presentation that I realised it's encased in some sort of clear dome. Now, I don't know whether that was just showing off the fact he had a radar or the belief at the time that the radar actually had to see where it was going to want to work. Uh, but, so after the war, when she was in the docker's hands, she went around looking in the... Uh, or visiting the haunts of the rich and famous, uh, and became quite famous herself, or possibly infamous herself, for the, for the parties that were thrown on her. Uh, particularly for, for Sir Bernard Docker's wife, Nora Docker, who was uh, quite famous for her partying. I believe she was banned from, from Monaco for insulting the, the royal family. Now this is, a, this is just a print from a photo, uh, from a postcard. This is actually taken in Cannes, uh, probably, in the, probably in the 60s at some time. Uh, it's interesting, I, I looked at Cannes on, on Google last night, and the smallest boat in there is probably the size of Shamara nowadays, uh, whereas in those days she was, she was the largest, largest boat. The only recognisable feature on the skyline is, is in this top left is the Miramar Hotel. Now that's still there, but the rest of it has, has all been replaced by apartment buildings. So it's quite an interesting sign of the times. Now, during the 60s, 70s possibly, uh, I think the Dockers fell out of favour. I think there was always a case of too much of a good thing. Uh, Sir Bernard died in 1978, uh, and the boat was bought by Harry Hyams. Uh, now Harry Hyams is a property developer who uh, was responsible for the Centrepoint building in, in London. Now, he's quite a reclusive character, or private character, uh, so there's, there's very little known of the boat, although I do hear stories that she ended up being based on the south coast and in a bit of a state of disrepair, uh, but in the end she ended up in Lowestoft, uh, which is where I first came uh, in contact with her. Now, fast forward almost 50 years from that previous photo, uh, this was taken in 2010. Uh, she still looks in quite good condition. In fact, she had a sort of skeleton crew on board comprising of a, of a, a master, an engineer, and a, and a deckhand. And they did their best to, to keep on top of the maintenance, but it was really only slowing the rate of decay rather than actually, than actually preventing it. Now, whilst they were up in Lowestoft, this was probably the foot, this was just before the boat was towed down to Portsmouth. Uh, the photographer that's associated with the project and provided these photos went around on the inside and took some, took some photos. Now this, in the machinery space, it's not an area I tend to go to uh, once I've designed the structure that everything sits on. This is the original swi uh, switchboard, uh, which I thought was fantastic. And it is, it's sort of made of 25 mil thick slate and weighed an absolute ton. You could barely pick up any individual piece of this, of this switchboard. Uh, it obviously been kept clean, uh, but the actual mechanical or electrical workings of it uh, left something to be, be uh, believed. Now, this photo may look slightly familiar, although this one's in colour and the previous one's in black and white. Uh, this is the same sort of part of the lounge uh, that we were looking at earlier. And if I just go to that, that photo again, if you look at the chairs and the furniture, you can see that in spite of the fact that those chairs are 72 years old, they needed a recover, but they, they were still there on board. I believe the carpet's the same, and, and this furniture is here is also the same. So 
in actual fact, she was, she was sort of a museum from, from, when was from the 30s. Uh, now, that was the, the forward end of the lounge. This is at the aft end of the, of the, of the same, uh, same compartment. This is looking out onto the aft deck, uh, where the steering position is, where we'll see in a minute. This picture here uh, is actually the owner's bedroom. This is looking aft. This is in that first tier of superstructure, uh, just behind that, that lounge you were looking at. On the right-hand side of the photo, uh, port side possibly, is, you can see the owner's bath. And interestingly in here, he had two single beds. It, was, it wasn't a double bed for him and her. Mrs. Docker, just two single beds. So I don't know whose insistence that was, that was due to. <laughs> right, how it, how it differs from uh, the GA will, the GA will come up in a minute, uh, but how their arrangement differed from what we've now done is that the, the compartments on the, on the sort of the main deck were off on the port side, and down on the starboard side was this quite wide, quite wide corridor. Uh, you, can, you can see by the, the, the careful adjusting instrument there that we, we were about to do something nasty to it. This was just before we started to, uh, to dismantle it for the refit. Uh, I mean, it, it all looks in very good nick, uh, but that's primarily because it was just, that was just the top veneer. As soon as you started taking anything below that, she wasn't in quite as good a condition as, as had been anticipated. Now, one area that was very nice uh, was the bridge. Now, other than the wheel, the binnacle, and a couple of other minor electrical items, there's nothing in there. Now, it is a far cry from how she's turned out. Uh, there's every electrical gadget in the world on board the, uh, the current boat. Uh, but we have saved the binnacle and we have saved the wheel. Uh, she actually had the binnacle on the inside and the binnacle on the outside. Uh, and we've got them both in the, in the original position. So we have done as much saving as we can. Uh, but this, this was the original bridge. And then, and then just to look at the joinery aspect of things, this is the stairs down to the, uh, down to the guest area from the, from the main deck down to the lower deck aft, which is where the guests were. And then this one is out to the aft end, out through the back of the lounge. This again is a, the doghouse with stairs down to the guest area again. Uh, you can see the secondary steering position uh, at the aft end. But whilst you can see the quality of the joiner on the doghouse, you can also see with the general, general condition of the steelwork, that's where the, the cracks, possibly the wrong choice of words, was, was starting to show. Now this, you're not meant to be able to read this, although if you can, I'd suggest you retrain as a fighter pilot. Uh, this is the original GA. Uh, where we were, this was this owner's lounge where we were. This is uh, the owner's bedroom with the, with the two single beds. Uh, and this is this large corridor with the various, various compartments off the side of it. The secondary steering position was back here with that doghouse going down. And this is the main sort of guest area. Now, interestingly, whilst these were called staterooms, they weren't necessarily en suite, uh, which is something that we've had to modify for, for today. Now, this is a profile, uh, original section, and it, it has caused me some confusion. I, I think this is a pre-war uh, picture, because if you look at the next one, now, this is, a, this is a, I think, is post-war, primarily because it's got radar on it. The most interesting thing, is the mast is absolutely, the rigging has changed completely. The, uh, if I just flick back to that other picture, the mast here is at the aft end. Both masts are roughly the same height. Uh, now, I don't know whether that was artistic license and the person who was doing it was just responsible for the, the main hull and he'd just drawn the mast on because he didn't know what else to draw. Uh, but this is how she appeared. This is one of the Vosper's drawings. Uh, and this is basically what, she's, what she looks like today. Right, in late 2010, uh, this was the boat as she was towed down from, uh, from Lowestoft to Porchester. So you can see, I mean, she's quite light here because she had all her insides taken out. She's probably got no fuel on. But you can see where the, the water line is relative to those port lights, whereas in that war photo, they were, they were literally a foot off the water line. 
But because she's, she's only 30 feet, 10 meters beam, uh, 65 meters long, she's quite easily driven. It's quite an easily driven hull form. Uh, the forward tug was far too big for the job and, and barely came out of idle uh, during the trip down from, uh, down from uh, Lowestoft. Right, in Lowestoft, uh, alongside, and the dismantling started. Uh, now, the interior joinery came out, which is still just this partition joinery, and basically fell off once it was, once it was touched. One of our main issues, and you can see all this plastic sheeting here, was asbestos. She was full of asbestos. Uh, this is probably in way of, uh, in sort of the uptakes for the machinery. Uh, it was quite a long, protracted and, and expensive operation to clean out all the asbestos. Right, this is the lovely bridge, unfortunately. Uh, stripped bare of all the, of all the equipment. Uh, we've still got... We've still got the windows. These were saved. They haven't been reused. Uh, they've got electric ones now. Uh, and ones that automatically, the blinds, the blinds are within the, the glass themselves. Uh, other things that have changed, these had, these had solid wood decks. I think they were sort of 65 mil thick in general. Mixture of teak and pine. Uh, we've ended up going for steel decks with, with pine on top of it. It actually works out about the same about the same weight. Right, when we started looking at things, uh, superstructure was, was, was shot. There wasn't much holding the superstructure onto the rest of the boat. So uh, difficult decision was made, we we're gonna take it off. As part of the design, uh, because we had to integrate HVAC and pipe work and all sorts of other things, we actually increased the height of the superstructure very, very slightly. Not by enough to change the overall look, but just enough to give us a bit more, a bit more uh, engineering space in the, in the deck heads. So, but she is starting to look a bit sorry for herself there. Right, this is in Porchester. Uh, she was dragged onto the ship lift. Uh, the tides up there aren't particularly conducive to getting a, a ship with a best part of four metre draft on, onto the ship lift itself. Uh, She has got a rake of keel, which I think has only been designed to confuse naval architects when they're doing the docking calculations. Uh, but in actual fact, they literally just dragged her onto a flat, a flat uh, trolleys and, and pulled her into the uh, and pulled her into the shed. Obviously, at this point, damaging the boat wasn't too much of an issue uh, because she was all going to be repaired anyway. And here she is in the uh, in the shed at Lowestoft. Uh, sorry, in uh, Porchester. Now this is. The old VT shed. I don't know if people are aware of that part of the world. Uh, I think VT used to do minesweepers and things like that, and and ribs. Uh, the other end of this is is a dry stack where they where they keep speedboats and, and ribs and the like. Uh, we're obviously using it for its intended purpose, and because of the ship lift and the, and the, the trolley, it's actually quite a good facility. Uh, unfortunately, the chap who owns Trafalgar Wharf. Uh, gets more money through, doing, through, through parking boats in there. So this facility is, is gone now. Uh, Shimara was, as soon as Shimara came out, they are, they are putting it to a uh, dry stack. So the whole thing is going to be a dry stack. Now, as soon as he was in the shed, one of the first things we did was take the engines out. Now, these were two huge diesel Polar Atlas engines uh, weighing about 50 tons apiece. Uh, we did try and find someone to give these to, uh, a museum, a school, anybody. Couldn't find them. Uh, so they ended up being scrapped, which is a bit of a shame. Now, we had to replace these with, with ballast because our, our new engines, which is just uh, generators, truck engines, in effect, uh, attached to an alternator, uh, weigh one-tenth of the weight of these. So we did have to account for the, the, loss, of, the loss of weight by adding ballast. Now this, uh, this picture, it's the, uh, the surveyor. The chap on the left, I think he's looking for sound material. The chap on the right is praying that he's actually found some. Uh, now, 
we did actually give a bit of a spray paint when she got there, uh, just to try and stop the corrosion. Uh, but it was only as we started doing proper NDE uh, and thickness gauging, we actually discovered the, the true extent of the horror that he'd bought. Uh, now this is in the shed. Basically, the, this, is, this is looking forwards. Uh, and this bulkhead right to the very back of the boat now uh, is, was the one that was out to the saloon. And the, the, the aft steering position and that, that aft deck. And actually the aft 50 feet, so 16 meters, 15 meters, was, was rotten. Uh, so we ended up, because there was no super stretcher there, we ended up chopping it off and, and throwing it away. I mean, there were some absolutely fantastic bits of, of skill. These, these propeller tunnels were, were just works of art, uh, all riveted together. Uh, I did try and save some, just some short lengths of riveted structure, but unfortunately I had a big tidy out one there and, and I lost it. So I was a bit sad about that. I do have a couple of rivet heads sitting on my desk, but, but apart from that, I've actually not got much of the original structure of the boat left. Right, this is a profile view of the, uh, of the boat. You can see, see back here, uh, this isn't the real end of the boat. The real end of the boat should be another 15 meters that way. Now, you'll note no, no bulbous bow. These black lines are, are, are bad. Uh, and actually in the end, we, we replaced basically everything from this black line down. That was, that was the, the full extent of, of all this plate had up to 50% wastage and, and more in some areas. So she was down to sort of four mil thick from an original Three eighths. Sorry, I keep mixing my units up. I do both metric and Christian units. Uh, only, be, only because sometimes it, it seems to be easier to portray it in, in, in imperial rather than, rather than metric. So, five minutes, okay. Right, I'm just gonna whiz through these slides now. This is a picture of the inside of the boat. Uh, looking, looking aft, the whole, whole inside is ripped out. Now, 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 at this point, this is, this is the owner, it's Charles Dunstan. Uh, we had a caption competition about this. All the captions included one word starting with the letter F. I won't, uh, and, and generally, what on earth have I done? Uh, now, whilst, whilst all those pictures are horrendous, it did sort of mark the turning point of, uh, of the rebuild. Now, this here, you can see the boat. Uh, we'd supported her, we'd moved to the right orientation. This isn't Charles's bullion in the foreground, this is actually the lead ballast that was going on board, on board the boat, about 160 tonnes of it. This was a combination of being uh, melted down and poured into a new box keel that we put on the bottom, uh, which is the quickest way of reducing the VCG. Uh, and the final sort of trimming, healing ballast was to, uh, it's just been put in loose ingots inside. Now back here you can see there's a new engine room, and this, we've put a bulbous bow on her. Not for any hydrodynamic benefits, but just somewhere to put the, uh, the bloody bow thruster, which was quite a large piece of kit, and we were going to start taking up fridge space or crew accommodation, so we put it, we, we built a bulbous bow as a new compartment in which to put the bow thruster. Now, this is looking inside the ship, this is actually the engine room. Uh, and you can see the old engine room, just uh, the new engine room off to the right, off to the left, sorry. Now, as in a thing, propulsion units, rather than going to the old to the standard propellers with shafts, it's all electric, five diesel generators, uh, and a couple of azimuths. Now they're fantastic. We've, we've achieved 13 knots forwards, and we've also done 13 knots backwards. Uh, <laughs> she's, she's on sea trials. I, I suspect that that might become a party trick in, 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 in the med, uh, with the ability to go backwards as fast as she goes forwards. Right, for those bits, we didn't, we didn't throw the whole boat away. Uh, we did retrieve all the port lights and things like that, which again were works of art. Uh, and here they are all being polished up. As we start to put the boat back together, this is cable running sheet. Uh, this was just the electricians trying to organize themselves for, for where the cables went. Stabilizers going in. Uh, she's got stabilization at rest, which means even when she's motionless, the stabilizers will waggle. Uh, so there's a gentle roll that will actually account for the roll. Superstructure, uh, a new superstructure was built out of aluminium. Uh, slight issue with attaching it to the steel hull. We use this stuff called triclad in the end, 
But even then, it's, 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 it's a difficult process because you're not allowed any cross-contamination. It's actually quite hard work. It was a challenging event. And this is uh, lifting, the, lifting the superstructure onto the boat. Now, even that wasn't exactly smooth because the amount of headroom we had to get the thing on uh, was limited. So we had to have this special cradle built rather than just relying on lots of slings. Uh, this is inside. This is on the original, this is on the original plating. Uh, now, you may think it was a bit callous to start removing lots and lots of original shell plate. Uh, we could have kept more, but the difficulties of joining two sort of remote bits that was, was, was quite hard work. Plus, when you face all these sort of seam straps and butt straps and there's holes everywhere, uh, it ended up, we could have spent 10 years trying to restore the thing, uh, but instead we just said, okay, we'll just, we'll just cut it off to a, a realistic point and go from there. What do you do about rivets? Now, we've done it, but I'm still not sure of the answer. Uh, we ended up welding them up. Every single rivet on the outside of the boat, they went around with a, with a, with a Dremel, in effect, uh, and then put a little line of welding. Uh, and that was primarily for the painters, so that when they put all the fairing uh, on the outside, any movement of the rivet would cause that to crack off. So, but it caused all sorts of issues. As soon as you put the heat on the weld, as soon as you put the heat on the rivet, then sometimes the rivet would just break and fall out, uh, and then you had a hole there. Uh, it was, it was quite difficult to do. Okay. I will. <laughs> it's up to you. You can carry on for five minutes. Or you can take I'll carry on. I'll carry on. Right, right. Now, there's actually only a couple more slides to do. Uh, this shows, this is one of the internal compartments. This shows the pipe work and the electrical stuff going in. We had all sorts of, all sorts of difficulties here. I mean, in 1937, when it was hot on board, the solution to it was, was opening the window. Nowadays, uh, we've got this all singing, all dancing HVAC plant that, that double dries it and all sorts of other things to it. All these pipes with the, with the black and white uh, bands on are all HVAC pipes disappearing around the boat. This was one of the less cluttered spaces. Right. And then in parallel to that, joinery started going in. Now, because it's a private yacht and it's his own home, They've asked me not to carry on with the, with the rest of the inside, so there isn't any more of how the furniture looks, but I can assure you it does look very nice. Uh, now this thing, this is our, this is our pipe work model. Uh, this is pipe work and mechanical systems. Uh, that bit there, possibly, this diagonal bit here is, is, is that previous photo that I showed you a minute ago. Uh, the fridge up forward, and these three little things, the extracts for the washing machines and, and tumble dryers. So, but, but that is all the systems on board the boat. I did wonder why we just didn't plate to the outside of the pipework and uh, be done with all the internal structure. Uh, this is the 3D model uh, showing the boat. Obviously the bulbous bow on it. Uh, and then the anchoring gear, that was another mission, but I won't, I won't talk about that now. Coming back along the boat, that big area of foredeck, either side of the doghouse, is where the is where the rescue boat and the owner's tender are going. Uh, on the forward mast, the, the the sort of the second pole is actually a derrick. Rather than going for a, a crane, we've kept with tradition and we've gone for a derrick. Uh, it needs about 12 crew to operate it, uh, and has yet to work successfully. But we'll get there in the end. Uh, going back down the boat, obviously the the accommodation, the owner's stateroom is is on the first tier of superstructure. Uh, the little round thing at the back is a, is a, a seawater splash ball. Personally, I don't think you can get the whole, thing, the whole thing right. I think that's possibly something that might come off the boat in the near future. And then, then a cutaway of the boat. It's not very good because we've cut away in the halfway. And because we've got central corridors, all you can see is the backs of the walls out of the compartments. The, the big area at the back, just in front of the azimuths, is the VIP cabin. We do have a bit of a noise issue there at the moment, which we'll resolve. Right. This is principal characteristics. I was going to leave this up whilst I did in the next bit, but we, we, we're running out of time, so I won't. Uh, I'll come back to that in a, in a second. Right, this is the... This is... What I'll do is if I take questions... Can I take two minutes of questions? Yeah. This is a video, in theory. <laughs> Right, this is the original launch. 
uh, was put together by our photographer. Note all the PPE that's been worn during the making of this, of this initial film. <laughs> now, if anyone's got any questions whilst, we're, whilst I'm going through this, I'd be quite happy to try and answer them. No, in interestingly, there was no budget. It wasn't unlimited, so we weren't allowed to take the piss, uh, but there was no budget. So long as we got the boat right. Uh, I mean, Charles, in his business life, he likes to zag whilst everyone else zigs. He just doesn't, if someone challenges him, he will, he will accept that challenge. And he decided that rather than going down the route of giving the boat to a traditional shipyard, uh, parting with vast quantities of cash, then coming back two or three years later with a, with a boat that he'd had little input into, he thought he'd go down the DIY route. Uh, and basically, he, he trusted the team to sort of form themselves and, and we rented a yard, we got the labour in and all this sort of stuff. And we basically made everything up as we were going along, which is one of the things that's made it quite difficult, is that every problem we come up against, as a group, you've never solved it before. Uh, we had no infrastructure. Right, that was the, that was the. Well, we're going to have to keep it down. This is a really good, this is, this is. How long, how long is it? Three minutes? Oh, okay. This is, this is. So this was, this is one of those little helicopters with a GoPro on it. So just in case you're wondering how it was done. Uh, Turn the boat out of the shed. So in answer to your question, there was no budget. He saved money on taking it to a traditional yard. So, and also uh, had more fun whilst he was doing it, because he was directly involved in some of the decisions we made. Yes and no. I do understand where you're coming from. And it's the same thing with, you get these people that rebuild Spitfires, they found the maker's plate in a field, and they build a Spitfire around it, and because it's got that original maker's plate, uh, it becomes an original Spitfire. We did try and save as much as we could. Had he simply built a replica, it would have always been a replica, or that would have been much simpler to do. So we did take, and it does incorporate some of the original boat, and had they had the ability to do the stuff we'd done in 1937, I'm sure they'd have gone down that route. So yes, I do accept. We weren't doing it as a historical mission, as it were. Charles had found the boat, fallen in love with it, and he wanted to, to have that original boat, so we did as, as best we could. So. Right, do you want me to stop, or are you happy to leave it on one? Now this, it was dragged out of the shed in, in, in Porchester. That's Charles on the right. I mean, even though in the sort of state he's in, he he's, was quite happy down there with his, with his camera taking videos of his own boat. Uh, I did point out whilst his boat was very nice, I thought the trucks were fantastic to him. Uh, he said he'd prefer to keep the boat. So we came out the, uh, we came out the shed uh, and stayed on the ship lift for I think two or three days uh, whilst we lowered the ship lift a bit, let the tide come in, let it fill up the sea chests and things, just to make sure that we didn't have any leaks internally. Uh, and, then, and then we launched a, originally we were going to launch using buoyancy bags down the side just to try and reduce the, reduce the draft. About a week before the launch, I'd, I, I don't know what came over me, but I said we'd get rid of the buoyancy bags and we could just launch straight away, which we did, but only by about 100 mil. Uh, so, which was, which was quite a lot of water, to be honest with you, uh, over what we, what we were thinking about at the time. Uh, the high pressure, there was a high pressure and the wind wasn't quite favourable and it was, yeah, it was all quite a, a painful process was getting the boat in the water. Right, any more quick questions? Pardon? No, no. We, uh, to de-risk the engineering side of life, the, the sort of the the mechanical design we gave to Rolls-Royce for them to give us a turnkey package, which we then integrated into the boat. So they've done the bow thrust of the stabilizers, the propulsion, the azimuths, and, and things like that. Uh, By planting the uh, aluminium superstructure on top, 
Did you learn from the failure of the Type 42 frigates, which uh, had a slight problem with corrosion? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> She's only three months old, so, so I mean, we've used this triclad. Right. So, so, I mean, it was the 22s more than the 42s that used the aluminium superstructure. Yeah, that's right. uh, but the same principle applies when you go to dead, dead, pull ahead, dead stop. Superstructure tends to move forward. It's much closer to back. Yes. I mean, this thing will do 13 knots, and, that, and that's full chat. And whereas, whereas a Type 22, Type 42 will do double that speed uh, on a good day. Uh, so the, the environment she's going to be used in, she's not going to be subject to, to massive loads. I mean, just, she pardon? Where she primarily trained? Palmer. Okay. So she's a private, she's a private yacht. Okay. Uh, Charles currently has no intention of chartering her out, although she's built to, to continue the previous speaker, LY2 code, which is the large commercial yacht code uh, that's just been updated, I think, last year, but we still fall under that. Uh, she's DMV high-speed light craft, or heavy, slow luxury craft, as I started to rename it. Uh, we did take some of the rules out of the ship rules uh, because we wanted unlimited service. Uh, two sets of rules aren't necessarily compatible with, with each other, so it was quite difficult. So, right, and that handily brings me to the, to the end. Sorry it was a bit rushed. Uh, <laughs>